This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Here we go! Listening to the Emerald Flow Show on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. Welcome to a very special episode of the Emerald Flow Show. Uh, we are a podcast on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. You can follow us on Twitter at Emerald Flow Show. And if you use Apple Podcasts, leave us a five star review. Uh, this is a very special uh, episode, as I said, because we're doing for the first time ever our half year award show. And we're very much sort of continuing on in the spirit of wrestling omakaze. And so as always, always a shout out and big thanks to John Carroll. So today uh, we have a very esteemed panel. Uh, I am, of course, Gerard Detroit here with Paul Vosch. And we have a number of contributors from uh, the Voices of Wrestling here to give their thoughts on how the first half of the year in Japan has gone. So yes, uh, it is going to be uh, Japanese wrestling only. And one thing definitely noticed, I think it's partly the pandemic, partly because every company seems to have their own streaming services. There's a lot less people out there who are watching everything. Um, That's certainly the case for me. So I think that we have a good mix of people that watch all sorts of different types of pro. So first to start off, uh, we have a contributor for Voices of Wrestling, the author of the Brockumentary documentary series, a co-host of the Smart Sports Podcast, Suit Williams. Suit, how are you doing? Doing good. Uh, I'm he- giving you the uh, New Japan normie slash Dragon Gate <laughs> pervert uh, perspective on things. So, Case and Mike, don't worry. I'm here for you. Uh, that is a very important uh, perspective, honestly, because uh, not a- everyone is watching New Japan a lot these days, although I think after Forbidden Door, that's going to uh, change a lot. If I remember correctly, when we actually reached out to Suit, he mentioned that as well, and our answer to that was just, that's exactly why we want you on the show. <laughs> well, we needed yeah. a New Japan watcher. Yeah, I was saying, like, well, I don't know, man. I've only been watching New Japan and Dragon Gate, and you guys were like, yeah, we need somebody who watches New Japan. And I just laughed. Perfect. But that's a really important perspective uh, these days, I think. And uh, I think, you know, a lot of people are going to start getting back into it. Next up, another uh, contributor to Voices of Wrestling, co-host of Jumping Bomb Audio. He is our uh, Joshi expert for this episode, Taylor Mainberg. How are you doing, Taylor? I'm doing great. I'm excited to be here, excited to talk about uh, some good wrestling and represent the Joshi side of uh, Japan here. Yes, and also uh, get well wishes to your co-host, Kelly Harris, who was supposed to be here, but unfortunately got covid Yes, 100%. Get well, Kelly. Uh, we need to do get back and do another episode, hopefully next week. So hopefully by next week, he's all healed up. All right. Well, we're thinking of you, Kelly. And next up, uh, a newer contributor to Voices of Wrestling. And uh, I, from my understanding, the first time ever podcasting for him in English, we've got Chris Gagson. Chris, how are you doing? 
Hey guys, uh, I'm fine and super excited to be here, but please bear with my English skills, like Gerard said. And uh, first time in English. And Chris, you sort of been reviewing uh, freedoms for Voices of Wrestling, correct? So you sort of have the what's going on in the deathmatch world. Yeah, I did some freedoms reviews recently and um, mostly watching freedoms the last month. So yeah, deathmatch is my thing this year or the last year, should I say. And last but not least, he is a Voices of Wrestling contributor and a co-host of You've Got to Be Kidding Me, a history of TNA podcast, which just celebrated the 20th anniversary of Impact slash TNA. It is very early in the morning where he is. We have Liam Jones. Woo. Um, so I never clarified this, but I assume I can vote for against all odds. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. Not a bad oh, little no. show. I watched it last night, but uh, unfortunately, no. Oh, there goes my Mike Bailey wrestler of the year case. <laughs> well, he may be back in DDT before the end of the year. So there's still- a I wouldn't mind that. Yeah. But yeah, I'm very happy to be here. Um, it is freezing. It is 6 a.m. But I am, I'm happy to be a part of uh, a panel where I get to talk about Puro because I don't get to talk about it very much, despite it being like my first love. <laughs> right. Okay, perfect. So uh, now that we have that all out of the way, we will move on to the awards themselves. We'll start on the category B awards, which is basically uh, where everyone gets uh, one vote. Uh, we'll start with uh, tag team of the year, uh, which interestingly enough, I really sort of feel like tag team wrestling has sort of fallen off in uh, Japan over the last couple of years. I think most notoriously with what has been going on uh, in new Japan, but it just doesn't feel like, uh, most companies have like more than a couple of big tag teams, even if they have multiples at all. Uh, so we'll start, uh, Liam, let's start with you. Who do you have for tag team of the year? Yeah. So, um, tag team of the year was one of my hardest categories, despite being my favorite type of wrestling, but there was just no one that really stood out to me. And so I went for a team that I've enjoyed more recently. Uh, but honestly it's kind of a poser pick because i liked them recently but i haven't seen the full year so i ended up going with fwc of kaguma and hazuki i thought this i really enjoyed their recent uh, efforts i like kaguma a lot uh, ever since hazuki returned to stardom i've been a big fan so yeah that was my my tag team choice of the year okay great and suit what have you got all right my pick for tag team of the year this is also pretty hard for me um because in New Japan, there's not a big emphasis on the tag teams in general. And then in Dragon Gate, there's been a lot of bouncing around with like the tree with like the uh, Triangle Gate titles. I don't think anyone successfully defended them this year. Uh, so I went with the only steady team that I've watched that have had pretty good matches throughout the year, and that's D Courage, Dragon Daya, and Yuki Yoshioka. Uh, they've had a couple good matches as champions, and they're a uh, match at Dead or Alive against Shun Skywalker and Diamante was very good. And it's also the opener, so it's free on YouTube. Perfect. All right, Paul, you're up next. Yeah, so I also kind of struggled with this category for a bit uh, because, yeah, it just wasn't really this, like, standout, no doubt tag team that just was the clear choice. So I decided to give a shout out to a team that I think has been doing, like, really good work recently. And that is the team of Hokuto Omori and Yusuke Kodama, the current All Asia Tag Team Champions. Uh, I think they've both really benefited from this run with the title that they've been having. And they've also been having probably some of the most entertaining All Asia Tag Title defenses that I think we've seen really in for quite a number of years, really. I want to say, like, I think their defense against uh, Rising Hayato and Atsuki Iyagi was probably the strongest all Asia tag title match that I can remember be going back at the very least five years, probably even more. So that's why to me, uh, they were the best tag team so far in the first half of the year. Okay, great. And Taylor? I went with Liam. I went with FWC as well, Koguma and Hazuki. I think 2021 for stardom was a bad year for their tag, uh, tag team scene, their tag title scene. And I think FWC this year has brought a lot of energy, has really brought that 
uh, seen back in a really cool way. And I think they're a really good team. They work well together and they bring a different energy than a lot of the other teams in stardom. So they were my, this, this category, everyone's saying they sort of struggled with this one. This one was really pretty easy to me going with FWC. All right. And Chris. Um, I've went with soul meat from freedoms. Um, Toru Sugiura and Tomoya Hirata. Um, I struggled also with the category and I think they're, yeah, the best tag team in freedoms, um, had pretty good matches over the last month. So I've went with them. Okay, great. And, uh, I guess I sort of struggled with this at all. I was sort of would have probably gone with runaway suplex, but they broke up in May. And if they had had a couple more matches, I probably would have gone with them but I'm just going to go with a pretty safe choice of the magical sugar rabbits of Yuka Sakazaki and Mizuki. I think they've been just really a like core anchor in uh, Tokyo Joshi this year, having some really good solid matches and, you know, certain something to brighten up the card, even if other parts at the top of the card are getting stale. And so from there, we're going to go next up to a rookie of the year. Uh, I'm sure that there'll be a lot of interesting picks given sort of the diversity of all of the different companies that we're all watching. So we'll go in sort of reverse order from uh, what we did before, which is where I just basically look at the names in order on Zoom. So I'll start. Uh, my pick is uh, All Japan's Ryo Inoue. Uh, he debuted on January 2nd of this year. And very early on, it was clear, like I just thought the way he moved around the ring was like someone that had a lot more experience that he did. Uh, he's already getting a lot more time in his opening matches to get in a lot more offense. And I really feel like six months into his career, he has um, sort of at a better point than the last group of rookies like Hokuto Omori and Asuka Aoyagi and Dan Tamara were six months in and they're all turning out quite well and starting to get pushes up the card now. So I really see big things in Inoue's future. And so Chris, uh, who did you have for Rookie of the Year? Um, yeah, maybe the hardest category for me because um, in Freedoms is no rookie at the moment. Um, big Japan does doesn't have anyone in this year so i've picked satsuki nagao but he's um, wrestling for two years now or one year i don't know exactly but he worked for big japan this year a lot more and not only for zero one so i've picked him i don't know if he's classified for the category we'll allow it uh that can get difficult sometimes when discussing rookies uh yeah okay great and taylor Uh, my pick was Juria Nagano from Tokyo Joshi. I think she's come in and really impressed me. Uh, been very strong. She has a really distinct style already, even though she's only been wrestling a few months. And I think that she's got a hugely bright future in the company. I think the company sees her as a big deal, which is always important. So I think that she is going to be really uh, maybe the biggest name in a group of rookies in Tokyo Joshi that's very good sort of uniformly. Uh, I think she may be the name to look out for. And Taylor, let me ask you, do you expect her to totally shoot up past like Suzume and uh, Miyu Watanabe? Um, that's a good question. I mean, the biggest question is whether those types of people, you know, the Miyus, the Suzumes, are allowed to move up any further than they already are. Um, currently, the answer to that is no. And if they sort of get stuck there, I could see Juria sort of getting to that point. Um, but I think they're just slightly ahead of her. If it were up to me, I think they would sort of reach the peak. You know, the Miyu, Suzume, uh, the Mizukis would reach the peak before Juria just because they're a little bit more experienced. But I mean, I could definitely see Tokyo Joshi has been willing to with Yuki Arai, uh, another rookie willing to sort of push these people up the card pretty fast. So I could see her getting, getting pretty high, pretty quick. Yeah. That was something that I was thinking about and I have a feeling that could very well happen. And so next up we got Paul. Okay. So uh, when me and Gerard were kind of thinking about the different categories and we ultimately settled on including rookie of the year, this for me was by far the easiest category from the moment we set this category. I know who my pick was going to be. And that's Takuma Fujiwara from Dragon Gate. Um, as Mike, uh, Mike Spears uh, from Open the Voice Gate uh, says, he's going to be a problem. He is so good already. He is out there having four-star matches he already. He made his debut in 
November, late November last year. And like three months later, he's in there with like Dragon Dyer having four star matches, like matches that like are like borderline match of the year contenders, which I'm pretty sure that's the fastest I've ever seen of a wrestler be this good right out of the gate. It's absolutely insane. And if like he probably even the stage that he is at right now, like even if he doesn't develop, he's going to be a great wrestler. But given the fact that he just made his debut, it's actually kind of scary to think about how good he actually could be once he gets that like more like veteran kind of reassurance and like what he does and that confidence and everything. Because he's already wrestling like other people are after like 15 years of wrestling. So to me, this was by far the easiest pick uh, of the entire ballot. So Paul, I don't know how much of the early stuff you watched, but how would you compare him to like Junakiyama or Utami Hayashishida? Yeah, so those are the two people that instantly came to my mind. And I was actually trying to think as well, how quickly, and I didn't properly check how quickly kind of Akiyama had a four-star match after he made his debut. Like I don't think it was that long, but I also don't think it was like less than three months. Yeah, Akiyama was in the finals of the 92 Real World Tag League. Yeah. So I think that was the next big one. Yeah. So like, like, like Utami Hayashida, I haven't, haven't really watched that much of her early stuff, so I can't really compare that much. But I think Akiyama is like the next closest comparison I have to Fujiwara. And that's some rarefied air we're talking about here. Like, barring any major injuries, this is going to be a very special talent. And I think this is really going to be the guy that is going to carry Dragon Gate for the next 20 years. And I don't think that's hyperbole, even in the slightest. Okay, awesome. And uh, suit up next. And I have a feeling I know where this is going. I'm so glad I was muted because, Paul, I was hooting and hollering while you were talking up Takuma Fujiwara. It's Takuma Fujiwara. The dude's going to be a very big deal in Dragon Gate. And since Paul brought up a bunch of my points, like I can kind of just talk about how Dragon Gate's cranking out like a ton of new talent over the last like three to five years like even if you want to start at like uh start once covid hit like since then they've got sb kento who is a bona fide star they've got uh madoka kakuda who uh got hurt but is kind of making his way back now and then you've got this new shun skywalker character well he's not a new wrestler but he turned so he's different now and then they just got a, a lot of good young talent that are making their way up and that are very good now. And if they develop, it's just going to make, it's just going to make a new like big six for Dragon Gate. So it is a very good sign for their future. But yes, rookie of the year, Takuma Fujiwara. Takuma gang, we're out here. And Sue, I'll just sort of ask you a similar question to what I asked Paul. Is there any sort of co- comparisons that you can think of of all of your years of watching wrestling? Uh, for me... I can't think of anybody who was like out of wrestling school this good this fast. Like I was coming into New Japan when they had like, you know, when they had their good dojo years of like Jay White and, uh, you know, Sho and Yo. But I don't know if those guys were having like four star matches out of the gate just because of the uh, limitations they had as New Japan Young Lions. So seeing a guy just fresh out of wrestling school being as good as this guy is it's unprecedented for me and if you want to see him there is a match he had with dragon dia uh, i think for the brave gate that is free on youtube it was the opener of one of the champion gate shows okay great very passionate explanations of fujiwara from both you and paul and so now we move on last but not least to liam hi it's takuma fujiwara ah okay uh yeah just a a slam dunk contender this guy he's insane you watch every match and you're like this guy's been wrestling for at least six years i won't 
believe anything else. I don't know what they're feeding these kids in the Dragon Gate Dojo. I don't know how many squats they're doing. I don't know what, how much, of, how many running, how many running, that's how that's pronounced. But you know what I mean? Like, what are they doing in this dojo? It's insane. The amount of talent they are pumping out here. Like, I thought SB Kento was going to be like the generational guy that comes out. And I was like, yeah, he's obviously the one that they're, they're going to hedge their bets on. Then Takuma Fujiwara comes out and I saw him in that first match, uh, the eight man tag with, um, Fuji, Mochizuki, Ariasato, and Susumu. And I was like, this guy is insane. And um, immediately as, when I first saw him, he um he reminded me a lot of the first times I saw Will Ospreay, but not as self-indulgent at the time. This guy was like just his smoothness in the ring and the way he moved about. I was like, this guy reminds me so much of Ospreay. And then, you know, throughout the year, he has all these really banger singles matches against like Espy Kento, Ishinahashi, and The Draw. Uh, Dragon Diet, obviously the one that everyone's uh, made note of. He's, I, I haven't quite got to the stage yet where young people annoy me, but he's very close because I'm like, you shouldn't be that good at the thing you're pursuing this early. It's not fair. And I'm a big fan that they've uh, sort of rushed his excursion out now. We're going to we're gonna see what he can do when he comes back, and I hope they strap the rocket immediately because this dude's something, and if you do it now, like... How old is he? I have his cage wrench up here. He's twenty-one. He's tw- yeah, so like you bring you bring him in with no major injuries or anything. You got like twenty years of this guy on top. So this is going to be the the age of Fujiwara. So let's see how it goes. And Liam, any sort of comparisons you can make to anyone you've ever seen before? I, I, very different wrestlers and very different circumstances but the only time i remember seeing like such hype for someone during their first year was maybe matt riddle when he started breaking out in evolve and people were like oh this guy's crazy this guy's the guy so like that's the only time i can think of hype on the same level but uh you know very different circumstances different parts of the world but yeah that's about it and it's like not even a direct one-to-one uh skill or match level because i think vijuara's had more matches that at a higher level than Matt Riddle had at that that point, but and um, Matt Riddle's biggest stuff when his first year was towards the end of his year, but uh, yeah, that's the only one hype wise I can think of. All right, so a uh, major player has emerged, uh, getting getting three uh, choices for Fujiwara, which is sort of interesting. I thought, given sort of how much everyone here on this panel watches a lot of different stuff, so from there we will move on to feud of the year and then we'll start with liam so uh i've just realized i didn't write down an answer for feud of the year so we're going to think on the top of uh my head right now feud you know what because there hasn't been a ton of feuds that i've been super into my first thought would have been like the prominence invasion of stardom but then like the the finish kind of tapered out and they didn't really do anything with it yet so I don't want to give it to that. Can I just be like a complete and utter like company shill and just give it to Bulk Orchestra versus the Gleet roster? Absolutely. And that, that's a good feud. So Yeah, I've really enjoyed that. So Suit, you're up next. Okay. Uh, my feud of the year is going to be Jason Lee versus Hume Skywalker from Dragon Gate. Um, this spurned out of the uh, dissolution of Masquerade. Uh, Basically, Jason Lee was kind of floating without a unit. uh, And there were like three units trying to fight for him. And Hune Skywalker was there like, no, you can't. None of you can have him. He's my property. And he's busy trying to gaslight Jason Lee and like make him. He's like trying to make him believe that he's his property and he belongs with him and Zebrats. And it's just very like interesting character work from Shun and Jason Lee. It's kind of worked in getting Jason Lee uh, more over in the company and kind of getting him a uh, a role within Dragon Gate when he uh, when he was floating for a little bit because Jason Lee's very good at the wrestling. So um, yeah, Jason Lee versus Shun Skywalker. It got a little thrown off because Jason got a concussion in uh, King of Gate, but I do think this will be. Uh, picked up on sooner than later okay great thanks and now paul so it seems like me and suit have some sort of mind melt going on right now because i am also voting for shun skywalker versus jason lee uh i thought this is just 
great case and mike got into our notes yeah <laughs> it's when when shun kind of made his debut uh i always thought that he was just going to be a guy that is like going to be like a baby face for life basically and then he just proved everyone wrong by having like one of the best heel turns i've ever seen just him just increasingly becoming unhinged after he lost the title and when he uh, shoved Dragon Dyer during the during the mask match and everything, and just becoming more and more delusional, and that just all culminating in this weird feud with Jason Lee, where it's just like the worst gaslighting you've ever seen, where he's just literally in the ring talking to Jason, being like, "No one, ha- no one wants you. No one wants to help you." When like every other faction in Dragon Gate is surrounding them, being like, "No, no, no, we want Jason. We actually want Jason on our team." And he just keeps talking until they cut off his mic. <laughs> it was the funniest thing I've seen in wrestling in like a long, long time. Just a great feud, and I'm not even sure if it's actually like 100% over yet. Like I think we've actually still need to see the finish for that. So I think if they can like nail the finish for that, I'm feel very confident in saying that like this half year vote is going to stay for the full year vote as well. Shun Skywalker's in like constant ability and dedication to never shutting the fuck up is truly, truly one of the highlights of the year. It's an energy I, I, I have to respect immensely. All right. And Taylor. I never can think of best feuds when I get to these lists. Uh, the only thing that popped in my mind was uh, Tokyo Joshi versus booking anyone in the main event scene who hasn't won a title before. Um, a major story of this year, um, as we talked about a few minutes ago, Tokyo Joshi has a number of people sort of in the upper mid card who are very good. The crowd is behind them. Um, Mizuki, uh, Suzume, the biggest is probably Maki Ito. People who are very big have the crowd behind them, and yet they get these sort of big title matches um, in the main events, and they continuously lose. Uh, There's only about four or five people who the title sort of hot potatoes between me, Yamashita, Shoko Nakajima, uh, Yuka Sakazaki, who are all very good, but it's sort of those people are the only people who can win the title. And it's been a source of frustration for many people. And I'm hoping that in the second half of the year, maybe we finally see someone break through uh, and win the big title. I mean, Maki Ito is one of the biggest stars in Tokyo Joshi and also one of the most notable Joshi stars in the whole world. And it seems crazy to me that she has not won their big title yet. Yeah, Taylor, let me just quickly say... uh... Toki Joshi Pro was in my like top three for like promotion of the year last year, and it won't be this year, or at least not at this half year point. And what you just laid out is the exact reason why. Yeah, I think they've done well. I mean, they're they're continuously improving in ring company from a company that a few years ago was almost entirely a sort of character fun driven company. But this sort of issue of these stars coming up is going to be the biggest thing that holds them back from really taking the next step especially as stardom who is sort of their closest direct competition continues to get bigger and bigger yeah it's funny you bring that up taylor because i've only really gotten into tokyo joshi in the last year but it didn't take long for me to sort of realize what was going on in the booking in that company and it's sort of uh you know i'm sort of concerned about how that yeah is going to go going forward so next up we've got uh chris um, my pick is ERE versus the Freedom's Army. Um, I enjoyed the whole feud a lot. Um, they bring in now Drew Parker uh, on the ERE side, and Masashi Takeda came back recently and joined. Hmm, not that friendly, but he joined the Freedom's Army again um, alongside Jun Kazai. And I don't know who is booking Freedom's, but they are so good so low-key cool puro booking going on there and yeah ere with freedom versus freedoms army is my pick for best feud yeah that's great i haven't watched as much freedoms this year as i would have liked but i've been definitely hearing good things about the direction of the company and so for my food feud of the year i am going to go with uh how versus uh neo in the rest of congo it's been a, in noah it's been a like a long-running feud that has taken a lot of interesting turns uh 
Neo lost the name match uh, against Hao, so he had to revert to his original name of Hiroki, aka High 69. Um, and then Hao just lost a loser leaves Noah match to Tadasuke about like a week and a half ago. And that was a really great match. It's one of those matches where uh, they managed to get the clap crowd to start making all of these noises because of all of the near falls towards the end. And I think it was like just a sign that while there's still lots of silliness and shenanigans in uh, Noah's like junior division, it's really improved because they're telling a lot more stories instead of just the constant uh, faction factional infighting and people switching up and everything like that. So that's something I really enjoyed this year. So now uh, we are going to move into some of uh, the more negative side of things before we uh, get into sort of the biggest uh, awards of the year. And so we'll start off with uh, worst promotion. Um, I'm kind of curious to see what other people are picking. My choice is um, Big Japan. Uh, I have watched a little Big Japan this year. There have been some good matches in Big Japan, but the booking and just the overall feel of the promotion is is pretty dire. And and I'm generally a little more forgiving of uh, Japanese companies because there's always sort of like a certain, unless it's like the scuzziest indie, like a certain like minimum standard of work that is generally pretty good compared to say, you know, what sometimes what you'll see in like North American indies, but just the overall direction of the company is just aimless, basically. So that's why I would sit, give it the worst promotion award. And Chris, what are your thoughts? Yeah, the same Big Japan for me here. I praised Freedom a lot. And now I have to dunk on them. A soulless and ableist deathmatch division, old farts on top all over again. Uh, and they're not putting over new guys in the division. Strong division was a bit better, but the deathmatch division is so, so bad at the moment. So annoying. Um, I like Big Japan a lot, actually, but the recent months were so bad for them so big japan also for me here freedom's lo loyalty over here yeah <laughs> all right and taylor i really struggled with this one i don't uh you know if i really hated a promotion and thought it was the worst i i probably wouldn't watch that much of it i think the company that probably has struggled the most uh this year in joshi is probably ice ribbon uh, through sort of no fault of their own. They lost Suzu Suzuki and the Prominence Group. Uh, Suzu was their biggest sort of up-and-coming star. They lost Sakushi and Tsukasa Fujimoto, who were their biggest sort of uh, veteran stars. It's been a very, very tough year for them. There were some rumors that they were going to shut down, which I'm glad they have not. Uh, but I, I wouldn't call them the worst promotion, by any stretch they still have a lot of good matches they still have a lot of very solid talent up and down the roster but i think they've had the hardest year of anyone and paul yeah so this pains me uh because my vote also has to go to big japan it's big japan was a promotion that i loved it's like back in 2018 i think they arguably had one of the best years in all of Poro that year, but it's just been all downhill since then. And I think they're kind of hitting rock bottom right now for a lot of the reasons that have been outlined already, where like the booking is just really atrocious. It's just, it's like, they're just really dire. Like they really have no other idea rather than just like for the strong division, then just going back to Yuji Okabayashi versus Daisuke Sekimoto. I think the whole way they handled the whole Drew Parker exit out of the promotion was also pretty bad as well, where they didn't even have Parker put anyone over and he just left the promotion and just vacated the title. Like he's uh, fucking uh, Trevor Lee with the CWF Mid-Atlantic title. Like he just, yeah, it's just awful stuff. Uh, it's maybe there is some point where they can still turn around i mean they still have some good talent on the roster as well but who knows how long they're still gonna stick around like especially in the deathmatch division they've just been bleeding young and promising talent uh so i think we're kind of like we're soon coming to a crossroads where i think if big japan doesn't turn around at that crossroads they're just gonna like keep going down a path that will inevitably lead to like the promotion like folding so I hope they will be able to like turn it around somehow. Well, I would strongly advise uh, against betting that Big Japan is going to fold, even if it just becomes a company that runs in front of seven people in a parking lot. 
I mean, maybe, but like, yeah, I mean, given that this is a promotion that used to run Thuma Hall, I'll buy the small setup, but like, yeah, I mean, now they're like drawing bigger in Shinkiba than they are in Corrigan. That's not a good sign. All right, and suit. This was a tough one for me because, uh, like I said at the top, the only promotions I've been paying attention to are uh, New Japan and Dragon Gate. And I certainly wouldn't nominate either of them for worst promotion. I could parachute in and say Noah, but that doesn't feel fair because I don't keep up with Noah. So, I mean, if I had to vote, I would say Noah, but I would feel more comfortable just abstaining because I just am not deep enough in the scene to see, like, who would be worst. Uh, well, Soup, I will give that a sort of a half abstention, half Noah, because, you know, I, I still watch Noah and I generally like it, but I know people that have stopped watching over the, this past year, and I think that's a bad sign for any company. Yeah, I, you know, the putting the title on, like, all the old guys is a problem, and my problem isn't that, like, it's old guys, period, but it is old guys who aren't consistently still putting on, like, you know, world title caliber matches. Like, I know Fujita can be good, but it's, like, few and far between. Mudo is completely washed, and, you know, you're doing all this, and you are drawing less in Corican than, like, a Dragon Gate. So it's just, it's hard for me to, like, just parachute in and say, this is bad, but from the outside, it don't look good. Well, exactly. It's not a promotion that's putting out an outside uh, sort of image of like something like, oh, I need to see that type thing, right? Right. And they have like the big like backing from Cyber Agent. So they have like, like I've seen like their big shows. They have like the production. They have the English commentary, which I mean, Twitter aside, they're pretty good at what they do. So they have what it takes to like have that growth that New Japan did at the, you know, the midpoint of the decade, but they just aren't capitalizing on it. And they're actively kind of sinking themselves. And it sucks because there's talent there that I'm interested in. It's just keeps getting cut off by, you know, veterans that don't want to put anybody else over. Yep, exactly. And now uh, Liam. Um, <clears throat> there will be no half measures here because I'm voting for Noah. <laughs> uh, see, I'm, I'm generally a pretty positive guy and I don't like doing worst categories generally, but so I've kind of in my head have changed them to either like most disappointing or people that represent something in the company. And for me, <sighs> Noah is like my biggest love hate relationship in Puro where I've had years like last year where it was my favorite company. And now I'm coming to years like this where I think it's the worst company. And that's kind of my story and my relationship with it. Because if you had have asked me this exact question in the first week of the year, I would have said that Noah's my favorite company. So it's just, it's really just, it doesn't come down to talent because there's a lot of great talent there. And I think it's pretty ironic that one of the things I would have criticized when they were at their best would have been the junior division has now become one of the most stable divisions for them. It's just the booking. And I remember recently on Twitter, uh, the global account sent out that like, that, that uh, request for how to fix it. And I was just, I was just going to send them an email that was just like, Western fans really like it when you push young stars and when you make them feel invested in these young stars because it feels like they're getting on the team early. And it and it it really feels like that's just the answer. And like I know that it's a lot more going on, but it really feels like there's a glaring thing that could be fixing the problems that, that a lot of people have with Noah and they're just sort of choosing to ignore it. Right. And that's what makes it makes it all the more frustrating to watch. Because all the people Because like there. you just want them to give it a go. Like, just give Inamura a shot. Like, because I know the obvious one is Kiyomiya, but it's like, even if you're not going to do the Kiyomiya thing, try try Inamura. He's right there. The The fact that Kenya Okada is still opening tag guy to me is insane because that dude's got mass. He's got a look. I think he'd be really good if he actually got the opportunities. And then, you, of course, you have, like, a lot of the um, new young talent in the junior division, but the junior division is just so 
um, all over the place, unless your name is Hayata. But you, it doesn't feel like anyone really makes any strides there either. So, because there's Yuseki Yoshioka, Alejandro. Yes, I'm picking the Wrestle One guys, but it just feels like there's opportunities to make guys into stuff, but they're either afraid or they just don't see it. Right. And I think that's a good way of like uh, really encapsulating all of it in Noah. So we'll keep the negativity going and we'll go to uh, worst wrestler of the year. And Liam, who did you think that was? So, like I said, uh, this isn't an actual worst wrestler pick because I really couldn't think of one, but this is just a representation of what Noah has become, and I gave it to Kendo Kashin on principle. Excellent choice. Now, Suit. I, once again, couldn't think of anybody here. Like, I could say, like, Toru Yano or, like, Punch Tamanaga, but, like, what are you really expecting from them? You know what they are at this point. Um... Evil doesn't really fit the bill because he's been he's been more tolerable as a mid card guy in the never division, and even guys like Jado, who I've watched, I've kind of enjoyed his little story with uh, the God face turn and how he's been uh, fighting off Ghetto and Dick Togo. So like I really couldn't think of anybody for this spot, so I just abstained. I didn't say anybody. Hey, so who was the your least favorite? G1 announcement <laughs> because that's how you can you can narrow Ooh, it down. Okay, there we go. Well, bad luck folly is still very bad. It, that like because if I had to pick one, it would be bad luck folly because man, that the announcement just takes the wind out of my sails every time. Yeah, you know what? I will pick bad luck folly. Thanks, William. Always an evergreen choice over the last few years. And Paul. So. For the longest time, I actually had Hayata penciled in for this category. This is just pushed really hard and he just has plenty of opportunities to have really boring singles matches that I have to watch. Um, but at the end of the day, like he still had some good performance, like not good performance, but he, but he was in like decent matches, like the one he had with Ogawa and everything and like some decent performances. So at the end of the day, I thought about, okay, who's a wrestler where I've literally didn't enjoy a single thing that they've done all year. And that was a very easy choice because that's Kendo Kashin. He's done not, not a single thing I've enjoyed the entire year. Let's he go. Managed, he managed to have a bad match with Don Fuji. How do you have a bad match with Don Fuji? That's almost impossible. But somehow Kendo Kashin managed to do that. Just absolutely atrocious wrestler. Always has been, always will be. Send him to the bin. I don't want to see him anymore. All right, uh, I will defend Kendo Kashin's 1999 uh, run in the New Japan Junior Division, but not much beyond that. Now, Taylor. Uh, my pick is in kayfabe and also out of it. Uh, I voted for Stardom's Waki Sukiya- Waka Sukiyama. Uh, she is a wrestler who the gimmick is she doesn't win any matches, uh, which can be a good gimmick. You had uh, Hanma do it in New Japan a few years back with the crowd behind him begging and hoping every time he got in the ring that he would win. Uh, The crowd in stardom does not have that same hope for Waka. Uh, She gets near falls in matches to absolute silence. No one cares. She's by far uh, of the sort of pushed wrestlers with stories. She is by far the worst wrestler on the roster. Uh, Someone who her matches come up, I know she's going to lose. And so I l- immediately lose interest in the match because you know the outcome before the match even starts. So she was an easy pick for me. All right. And Chris? Um, I couldn't think about one at first, but I also picked Bad Luck Fale. Um, Still bad, boring. I've watched a couple of New Japan shows and he's still, after all those years, when it's not against Okada or Tanashi, one of the worst wrestlers on the roster, and um, him being in a G1 is a punch in the nuts for, I don't know, so many people like Carl Fredericks or others. Yes, definitely. We might have to uh, ban Bad Luck Folly from these awards uh, if he wins too many times. Uh, okay, and for me, uh, I thought, you know, uh, a little hard, but sort of actually uh, in the, during this month, it all came together for me. And I'm going with DDT's uh, Yuki Ino. Um, he takes everything that people don't like about Dan Shoko Dino. And I don't mind Dan Shoko Dino at certain times, but he just takes everything to like 11 that you hate about a Dino match with all of the stupid shenanigans 
and his bare butt and just totally drag stuff down. He really dragged down the two matches in the King of DDT tournament that just happened that he was in. Although I like, like the tournament as a whole, but that really sort of dragged it down. He had an awful match with Jun Akiyama. And like, you know, if you're gonna have a shitty match against Akiyama, you're just gonna get on my bad side. So that would be my choice for worst. It's a uh, shame because he was so awesome in All Out. Yes, but just the and like, gimmick is awful. And especially during like that um, Manji Manji run, like when they were had like the weekly show, he was so killer. And it's so disappointing to see this pheromone stuff. And like, I'm someone who likes DDT comedy for the most part, but even I'm like, and I, I like Dino for the most part too, but this pheromone stuff, because it's with someone that I had such high hopes for, adds like that extra level of disappointment to it. Yeah. It just makes it so much worse because I was like, oh yeah, you know, like he's like a guy maybe they can like do something with and then. And like, no, no, no it, this is what we're doing with it. He's the worst version of Dino now. Congratulations. Yeah, just like the worst, like Dino. If you do, if you, so if you don't like Dino, you're definitely going to hate Eno because even the Dino uh, fans uh, can't, some Dino fans can't stand Eno. So that sort of uh, drags into the next category, which is the worst match of the year. And for that, I'm choosing Yuki Eno versus Mao uh, from the King of DDT tournament on June 16th. Just awful. Like you knew this match was going to be ridiculous because Mao came out in a hazmat suit to protect himself from uh, like Eno's butt spots, but then, you know, everything fell apart and it went like 15 or 16 minutes was just, just way too long. And I, I thought to myself, like, this is why sometimes I can't watch DDT undercards. And I like generally will fast forward sometimes to the second half of the card. Although, you know, I, I haven't done that recently, but I'm going to maybe start doing it again. And so, uh, Chris, what was your worst match of this half year? Um, it's maybe not that fair, but I um, have picked uh, Farless Six Men at Wrestle Kingdom. There are plenty of others, other bad matches, I think, but this one screams to me like boring. The best thing was that Honma won the match with a Kokeshi at Wrestle Kingdom, but yeah, it was so damn boring. So I've picked this one. Okay. And Taylor? I couldn't think of uh, one match, but I did think of uh, my vote is for all the time limit draws that Stardom does. I calculated about a month or two ago, and I think that they were on pace to do about 75 time limit draws in the year 2022, which is uh, insane to me when you consider that companies like New Japan and other places do about five a year. Um, I really think that they've leaned on the time limit draw as sort of a tool to avoid making choices on moving people up and down the card. And I think it just makes so many matches worse when you get excited for a match between two people or groups of people that you really like. And you sit there and you just go, oh, but I already know this is going to go to a time limit draw. And it does. That's the worst feeling for me watching wrestling is sitting at the beginning of a match knowing how it's going to end and then just watching it end the way that you hoped it wouldn't. Uh, so that is my vote. Taylor, did you used to think, sorry, I had another question for Taylor too, just quickly. Do you think that was a reflection of having a smaller roster for a long time? And now like that is something that the plant like eventually will start to fade out. Or do you just think that's the booking philosophy? Uh, I thought, and I sort of hope that it was part of the smaller roster, but it doesn't, seem to be slowing down all that much as they continue to add people and it seems to happen on shows uh, like the the smaller new blood shows they also have time limit draws which are sort of outside they've sort of deemed them like sort of outside of stardom canon so i think it's just a booking philosophy and i think it's a thought with the booking that if people draw you're essentially not knocking anyone down but my philosophy with the time limit draws is if you do so many time limit draws, you're also not lifting people up, which is the other, you know, it's a delicate balance. It's why wrestling booking is not easy. It's why not every company succeeds, but sometimes with matches between big stars, you have to sort of take some risks. You can use a time limit draw to good effect and stardom has done that from time to time but i think a lot of it is just the booking philosophy of well we have to do more shows um but we don't want these people to look bad so we'll just book a time limit draw and 
you know, people will be grateful that they saw all the stars they wanted to see. Yeah, what I was going to ask, Taylor, did you expect that Goddess is a stardom title match to go to that 30-minute draw that just happened? Um, you know, I'm now at the point where nothing really surprises me in terms of time limit draws. You know, the at the beginning, you know, I've been talking about these time limit draws. We've been doing Jumping Palm Audio now for almost two and a half years, and they were doing it two and a half years ago. And there was a common defense of, oh, well, it only happens on the small house shows in, you know, sort of mid-card matches where it doesn't matter. And then it sort of seeped into the bigger matches, you know, the big um, Utami Shuri match last year that everyone loved and gave five stars. It was sort of the perfect match to parachute in on because they went to a time limit draw, which sort of annoyed me and took away from the match. But if you had never, if you hadn't watched Stardom or didn't watch it regularly, it would just be like, oh, a time limit draw. And the time limit draws are continually seemingly seeping into bigger and bigger matches. So I'm not entirely surprised that the tag title uh, went to the time limit draw. Now I'm really not surprised when anything goes to a time limit draw, to be quite Taylor, honest. Taylor, do you think that the, the Grim Reaper will be going to a time limit draw? <laughs> In a casket match? Yes. Uh, I would hope not because I want to see someone be put in a casket in a start of match. <laughs> the time limit is just old age. <laughs> yeah. All right, and Paul. Yeah, so for me on this one, when I'm considering worst match of the year, I'm trying to think of like, maybe not just necessarily like the match was like sloppy or anything like that. For me, it needs to be a match that made me, or where I was bored. It needs to actually need to be a match where I was angry. So for me, there were really only two candidates for this. So the first candidate, which is not the one that I actually went with, is the uh, Tanahashi versus Kenta match from Wrestle Kingdom. I just despise this match because it also injured Kenta and it's just this terrible WWE style hardcore match. But even that was not enough to like for me to like overcome my hate for my actual pick, which is the never title match from Wrestle Kingdom between Tomohiro Ishii and Evil. Just an absolute goddamn waste of my time. Just, I felt betrayed watching this match. Just to actually have a bad match with, bad match with Tomohiro Ishii should be impossible. Yet somehow Evil managed to pull that off. And he actually has improved since then, which in a way actually makes it worse. Because this was very much in the year of all evil performances, just incredibly boring control period by evil, where it's just, he just does nothing basically. And it's just nonstop house of torture bullshit all the goddamn time throughout the entire match. And just, I hate this match. I hate this match fuck it minus five stars all right i think paul you got your point across uh suit well me and paul both reviewed wrestle kingdom night one for the website and uh yeah we have the same pick evil versus ishii um this was a complete just it was a complete just like lack of understanding of like how ishii got over because like Evil did all his, like, cheating stuff, but Ishii never fought back. Like, he just he just went down and lost. And it was all to set up a six-man tag the next night where it's like, okay, maybe Ishii will get his win back there and they win the six-man tag. Nope, they lose those two. So, absolutely just pointless. Bad. And it's stupid to try and get heat when a crowd can't boo. Like, Part of me wants to go back, well, for many reasons, go back and see what this goes looks like without COVID because A, COVID wouldn't be a thing. But B, I want to see if this evil thing, like, if it feels as bad as it does now, if people are, like, into it. Because I don't think it would be. But we are where we are, and it is what it is. Yeah, I think there were probably a lot of people more into it at first as just, like, the whole, like, ooh, LIJ breaking up. But I think his subsequent booking has clearly shown that they have sort of lost somewhat faith of him being like a top heel yeah i do think i think they've course corrected on that i don't know if they don't believe he can be a top guy or if they just realize this isn't working right now 
maybe once crowds cheer again, and I know it feels like we say that every month with Piero, but maybe once crowds cheer again, they'll give it another shot, but I don't think they're going to be able to get back that, um, that initial like feeling. Because I was interested in the idea of Evil turning on LIJ, because I do think that would have, it would have done big business and it would have been interesting, but the way they went, it just didn't work at the time. All right, and Liam. So again, this is not um, an actual. Okay, so I'm gonna pick a match that I thought that I thought was actually good, but I hate it on principle, and that is Fujita versus Nakajima, a match that I like, but goddamn, if it isn't the perfect representation of everything I dislike about my worst company of the year. No, that's a perfectly good choice. Like sometimes it just has to be about how it makes you feel as opposed to being like, oh, they blew a spot here, here, and here. So definitely. All right. So the negativity is over and everything is going to go up from here as we move into the category A awards. So all of these are going to have your top three choices. And then for wrestler of the year will be your top five choices. So just give them like start three, two, one. And so we'll start with Liam. It's also the category S award. I just wanted to make sure that that comes across. It's triple S, super sexy smoking star. That was four S's. My DMC knowledge is out of whack. Um, sorry, was this best show or was this uh, rest of the year? Oh, sorry, best show. Best show. Um, so after all that Noah hate, I can't wait to tell you that at number three, I have Noah the new year. <laughs> So um, this is when I was still hopeful for the company. I thought this show rocked. Um, I watched that main event of Nakajima and Shiyazaki and was like, this is what I want from Noah. This big, grandiose, epic style wrestling with that kind of 90s vibe to the actual matches. I thought that was really awesome. Number two, because why would I be here if I couldn't give Gleet awards? I have to give it to Gleet G Pro Wrestling version 18, which was the show where they crowned the first G Rex champion, which had Lindemann and T Hawk. It had Hayata Tamura versus Ito. Oh, the whole undercard was awesome. And then in the main event, you had the banger uh, G Rex first champion decision tournament final match with L Lindemann and Hayato Tamura which ended the show with Kenta Kabashi and Lindemann hanging out in the ring. What more do you want from a pro wrestling show? And just to be the worst guy, because it's eligible, I have to give the best bureau show of the year to AEW and New Japan Pro Wrestling Forbidden Door. <laughs> just to be the worst. Because I watched that show, and not only did I think it was show of the year, I thought it may be the best show ever. Wow. Okay. Uh, suit. All right, at number three, I have New Japan Pro Wrestling's Wrestling Dontaku Show. Um, this show had the Tanahashi Ishii match for the U.S. title, and it also had Naito versus Okada in the main event. And this show, top to bottom, was a very good show, and it also gave me that feeling with New Japan, like, okay, things are picking up, we're on the right track, we're not all the way back yet, but things do feel like they're moving in the right direction for this promotion. So I, for number three, I picked that show. Number two, I have Dragon Gate's first Corican of the year, Open the New Year Gate from January 12th. This was just a run-of-the-mill uh, Dragon Gate uh, Corican until the last hour, which I believe it was Liam that said this show the last hour of that show was booked like if Vince Russo liked pro wrestling. That was the uh, show where they had R.E.D. win the trio's titles, then break up, then Dragon Daya made his return and won the uh, Brave Gate title in the surprise main event. Um, that was culminating basically like the last two months of stories in Dragon Gate. So... It was just um, an insane, like, end of a show that I don't remember ever feeling that way at the end of a, a pro wrestling show before. So uh, January 12th, Corrigan for Dragon Gate is my number two Puro show of the year. And number one, I did tell you I was bringing the normie vibes here. Uh, it is Forbidden Door. Um, it is possibly the best show in AEW history one of the best pay-per-views of the last decade and maybe one of the best American pro wrestling pay-per-views ever. 
it was top to bottom fantastic and it was all done with like half of the AEW roster hurt and a lot of top stars in New Japan not coming so imagine what this could be next year okay and Paul okay so for my number three I went with All Japan's Champions Night 4 from Ota Ward it was incredibly close between this show and the Cyber Fight Festival but ultimately the deciding factor was the same deciding factor that I had between my number one and my number two show and that's the fact that like on the Cyber Fight Festival I had nothing that I would even consider for like my match of the year despite all the spectacle that was on there whereas the Jake Lee versus Kenta Miyahara main event definitely uh, is a match that I will put into consideration for that and I think also there was just a lot of other like really good stuff on that show as well like it's definitely been like the strongest top to bottom card that all japan has put on for like a long long time uh just some question booking decisions maybe but some great booking decisions uh if you want to and, and i mean the show was so good that like me and gerard like <laughs> we broke our schedule for this show i think that just i think that more than anything really is kind of an indicator how good this show was as well because we just couldn't wait to give our takes on the show for two weeks so we just recorded like five days after we recorded our previous episode just for the show um so then my second pick is uh forbidden door uh, i think a lot of has already been said about that show it's just an amazing show like it definitely benefited from the fact that it's like the only show that's probably going to get votes here that happened in front of a crowd that is allowed to cheer. Uh, but yeah, just a great show top to bottom, really kind of no weak match as well. But I also would say that there was really no match on there that I would consider to be like a match of the year contender. So that's why I didn't put it number one. And what I went with number one is no other new year. It's I had actually somewhat forgotten how much I actually love this show. And it's actually in preparation for this. I actually reread my own written review that you can find on voicesofwrestling.com. Uh, and I just like went through the show again and just like brought back all of my memories of it and just how much I just absolutely adored the show. It was actually one of the inspirations why I like hit up Gerard to like start the podcast in the first place. Uh, just really great. Just again, another one of those shows where there's really no weak match on the card as well and just an absolute massive banger of a main event and just yeah really great show top to bottom so easy pick for me for show of the year so far all right and taylor uh my number three pick was stardom world climax night one the best uh which was the first of stardom's two sumo hall shows back in march uh, this was my favorite one of the two. It had a lot of fun prominence, undercard stuff, which was mentioned earlier. Had the return of Kyrie to uh, stardom. Had a really fun uh, tag match uh, near the top of the card and was capped off by a big Julia Shuri title match, which I went four and a half stars on. So that was my number three pick. My number two pick, a pretty consistent uh, choice for my best shows every year the Tokyo Joshi Itanyo Korokan Hall January 4th show they always put on a really fun show you always have the Shoko Nakajima Hyper Masao uh, gimmick match but this one had a really strong semi-main and main event uh, Maki Ito and Hikari Noah in the semi-main and then for the Princess of Princess title Mi Yamashita versus Mizuki which I went four and a half stars thought it was a really strong show and my number one show a show i watched very recently stardom fight in the top nagoya summit battle uh, from june 26th only had six matches uh, but on the top four matches were all four stars and above for me including five stars for the cage match between tom nakano and natsupoi which i thought was an incredible match and i will talk about more in a little bit all right and chris my number three pick is also wrestling on taku um i thought the show was pretty good the last three were all over four stars for me with um ishimaru despi the great tanashi ishii match and okada versus naito the good 
Um, best of the Super Junior announcements like Akira, Utah, Connors and Austin. Um, number two is Forbidden Door. Um, I think there was enough talk about it. And surprise, surprise, number one pick is Freedoms, Hot Free People 2022. The biggest freedom Freedoms event ever in the Yokohama Budokan. Um, great main event, main event between Masaoka and Toru Sugiura, Jun Kazai against his friend Toshiyuki Sakuda. Big Chuji was in the show against Hirata, and Masato Tanaka was also there. So, yeah, that's my number one pick here. Okay, great. And for me, uh, number three, I also went with Noah the New Year. It was, I think, sort of like the pinnacle of Noah's year. Uh, uh, so far this year, everything has kind of been downhill, although not totally, but in many ways. And like that Keno uh, versus Kaido Kiyomiya match, uh, I'll talk a little more about later. And the main event was also tremendous as well. Number two, I, I'm a sucker for spectacle. I can't deny it. So I went with the Cyber Fight Festival. I mean, how could I not list like a show with some of the greatest entrances in wrestling history, especially the Go Shiozaki, like Roman Empire uh, entrance, which I think might be my favorite entrance in professional wrestling of all time. The wrestling was still, you know, pretty good, nothing like super high end. And it was still overcome despite the, the infamous slap. And number one uh, for me was uh, All Japan's Champions Night 4 on June 19th. Like Paul said, one of the strongest top to bottom uh, shows in, in All Japan in quite some time. I thought it was the best uh, Kento Miyahara versus Jake Lee match since Jake Lee turned heel. It was a lot better. He wasn't doing his usual like brooding heel stuff. It was a lot tighter uh, match structure. Uh, I thought also like the fact that Shotaro Shino and Ryuki Honda beat the Twin Towers of Shuji Ishikawa and Kohei Sato for the world tag titles was a huge surprise, something that I didn't expect. And it was proof that they are actually serious about pushing young talent because Honda is now the youngest world tag team champion in history in the company at only 22 years old. So yeah, despite some questionable things that could go south very quickly, I thought that this was a great culmination of a very strong uh, first half of the year for all Japan. And uh, so from there, we are going to go to a match of the year. Another three choices. Number three, uh, I sort of hinted at it, but uh, my number three match is Kaito Kiyomiya versus Keno from uh, Noah, the new year on January 1st. Uh, this was just, I thought, incredible. They have had great matches before. Keno was, have been, has been a very um, important opponent in Kaito's development uh, since he sort of came back from excursion and won the GHC title for the first time. Their chemistry is incredible, and I think they have an even better match in them. Uh, my number two match was Yuma Aoyagi versus Jake Lee from the finals of the Champion Carnival on March, or sorry, on May 4th. Uh, I think this was a surprise to a lot of people. People thought that it was going to be Jake winning again, but then uh, him and uh, Yuma have this really hot match that goes half an hour, and then just with an incredible closing sequence and Yuma getting the shock victory again, like I said, they're all Japan's starting to push young talent and Yuma has really emerged. I think is like one of the 25 best wrestlers of the world and listeners of this show might have been able to pick what my number one match of the year choices. And it is Kento Miyahara and rising Hayato versus Yuma Aoyagi and Atsuki Aoyagi from all Japan on May 14th in Sapporo. This was a 30 minute tag uh, team draw that was building to the triple crown match between Kento and Yuma the day after. I just thought this was, an incredible match that accomplished so many things. Uh, Hayato and Aoyagi sort of established themselves. They were formerly tag team partners, but from this match, they've started to sort of build uh, like a rivalry between them. And it's quite clear that those two are going to be the future of All Japan's junior division. And then it really built really well to the Kento versus Yuma match the next day. And by going to the 30 minute draw, um, I think they sort of made it like a lot more unexpected of who would win the triple crown match. I mean, ultimately Kento won, which I think most people expected, but I thought doing the draw cast a lot more doubt that Kento would be retaining. And just to me, it was just this incredible 30 minute, like no downtime match with the young wrestlers getting a lot of shine, building to a couple of big matches. So it was just yeah, incredible. And I've been raving about it and I've, I've watched it like five times. So those are my choices. Anyway, so we go to now to Chris. 
Mein Number 3 Pick ist Masato Tanaka versus Takashi Sugiura from the July 4th show. I think that this was the Shinji Rotani 8 show. Um, I absolutely enjoyed the match. It was better than their first match at January 1st, I think. Um, just two veteran guys hitting each other with so much violence and power. I absolutely loved the match. Um, number two was Hiroshi Tanahashi was Tomohiro Ishii from Wrestling Dontaku. It's it's like the same two veteran guys. Um, I think Tanashi is still one of the best wrestlers out there. Um, Ishii is insane, still insane, and um, yeah, it's it's my my favorite New Japan year uh, match of the year, of course. Um, and my number one pick is from Freedoms Daisuke Masaoka versus Toru Sugira from Hot Free People. Um. They couldn't use light tubes here, but you, you, it, it was it was still so good without the light tubes. You had no canvas here, um, chimera boards. They they put a hole in the ring and Sugira pie driver him um, through the hole, and it was so emotion, so so much emotion here, and um, yeah, probably the one of the best death matches the last i think five years okay great and taylor my number three match was the magical sugar rabbits versus free wi-fi from tokyo joshi yes wonderland on may 3rd this was a match that usually this was for the tag titles in tokyo joshi usually those matches semi-main or main event uh tokyo joshi shows this was one was at cork and hall and Yuka Sakazaki had to get on a plane and go over to AEW. So this match actually opened the show, and it was really great. It was super high energy. The Magical Sugar Rabbits did that sort of Tanahashi working quasi heel stuff, really stomping down free Wi-Fi. Uh, great finishing sequence. So that was my number three match. My number two match is Starlight Kid versus Azumi from Stardom Cinderella Journey in Nagaoka on February 23rd. Uh, Starlight Kid and Azumi are two of my favorite wrestlers who I've been behind. They've been a little stuck in the mid card uh, for the past few years, but they had this match. It was super fast paced. Uh, part of the both these wrestlers part of the high speed division in Stardom, so it was really fast paced. Some crazy moves. Canadian destroyers, things like that. Uh, you know it was really good because it broke out sort of of the Joshi bubble into the world of it was retweeted by Will Ospreay. It was talked about by Dave Meltzer. So got a lot of people talking. But my number one match and my only five-star match in Joshi so far this year, Tom Nakano against Natsupoi from Stardom Fight in the Top on June 26th. I want a full five stars. This match is technically, it's a fairly unsound technical match, but it is in a cage. It feels like a fight. It feels really brutal, uh, especially for a match that doesn't have any blood in it. There's a lot of people being thrown into the side of the cage sort of unceremoniously. There's a spot where both of them are sitting on the top of the cage and they fall off back into the ring sort of with no... Uh, you know, no way to sort of catch themselves, which is a very scary spot, but just a very tough, brutal match that I love. So that was my easy number one pick of the year. Okay, and Paul? Yeah, so um, my number three vote here is for Kazuchika Okada versus Jay White from Dominion. Uh, I thought this was just, like, these two really just give me exactly what I wanted of wrestling. Uh, and this was yet another tremendous performance. Don't think it was their best match against each other, but it was definitely damn close as well. And it just really reestablished Jay White as well after he was kind of gone for really, really like a long time. Like, and it actually felt like he was gonna like be gone from New Japan as well. And now he's just back and he's the champion as well. And he ended what was like a tremendous Okada reign to get there as well. Um, so my number two vote is Katsuhiko Nakajima versus Go Shiyazaki from Noah the New Year. Again, 
talking about it again, it's like what I want out of wrestling. It's really kind of something like this exact match here. It's just there's just so much emotion that was attached to this. Like it's you had like very clear roles as well, like just Katsuhiko Nakajima basically being the devil and Go Shiozaki being like the conquering hero. Only that obviously in this case the conquering hero actually fails in his task. <laughs> um just yeah, great stuff. Like all of the access followed basically like culminating in this match and Nakajima and on what at that point I thought was like really like kicking off like a long reign throughout the most of the year. That was obviously not to be, but at that point, like it felt like the kickoff was something bigger. And then my match of the year uh, so far is the championship carnival final of Jake Lee versus Yuma Aoyagi. Uh, I thought they told the story in this match perfectly where Jake Lee came in as the favorite but slowly but surely, like you believe more and more that Yuma was going to win. And then Yuma actually does pull it off. And in a way, it actually also was something that I what I feel like is going to lead to kind of like a character change for Yuma or like a style change for Yuma. Because this really was like the perfection of the Yuma in the underdog role where he just refuses to give up and he just manages to fight his way back. And he has been wrestling slightly different since this match where he's more confident now, like now that he finally managed to win a big one, to win the champion carnival, like he has been wrestling slightly different. And I think just culminating a character in this way and then moving on to something else. I think that's something special. All right. And now up next is suit. All right. For number three of my match of the year from wrestle kingdom 16 night one. It is the main event, Shingo Takagi versus Kazuchika Okada. Uh, the uh, Shingo has quickly become one of my favorite wrestlers of all time against one of the best wrestlers of all time. Uh, they did callbacks to their previous matches in uh, the G1 and the New Japan Cup uh, from years prior, and it is just two of the best guys going. I went four and a half stars on that one. Number two. I went four and three quarters on this one. It is Shingo Takagi versus Zack Sabre Jr. from night. What night was it? One of the nights of the New Japan Cup. 14. There it is. Uh, I think this was the semifinals. Uh, yeah, Zack had a great New Japan Cup. He uh, were, had a four star match with Okan, I believe. He had a four plus match star with Will Ospreay. And then he had this match, which I th just thought was excellent. I thought these two worked together just so excellently with Zach just twisting Shingo all sorts of ways. And then in the end, uh, Shingo trying to brute force his way out of a choke with Zach keeping it on and getting the win. So uh, that is my number two, Zach Sabre Jr. versus Shingo from the New Japan Cup. And my number one match of the year, uh, from Wrestle Kingdom Night 2, it is Okada versus Osprey. Uh, take what I said about Shingo and Okada and just paste it here. Uh, yeah, Will Osprey is one of my favorite guys of all time. And Okada, again, that guy's pretty good. And they just had a match full of callbacks, full of stuff that they've done and redone and countered and recountered. And Okada stands tall at the dome. Doesn't get much better than that. So a match of the year, Will Ospreay versus Kazuchika Okada. All right, and Liam. Um, so with Japan this year, I didn't feel like I had any blow away match of the year candidates. Uh, I'm sorry, like the top tier, uh, like five star, 4.7, five star range, but and that's with the caveat that I haven't seen Taylor's match of the year and I am a giant Tam fan. I walk the Tam road. So I'm looking forward to catching that and I could very well make it into my top three. But as standing right now, my number three was Hiroshi Tanahashi versus Tomohiro Ishii from Dontaku 2022. This match had that real old school flair to it that I loved. It was two old dudes beating the shit out of each other. It was 
heavy. It just had that heaviness to it. It felt like everything had loft and felt meaningful and was intense. And Tanahashi's had been a dick in it and you're rooting so hard for Ishii even though you know there's very little chance that he wins it. It was just a, a really interesting match and one that I really loved. Um, my number two was Azumi versus Starlight Kid. This was um, a match that I was watching and I was like, this felt like I was watching the future of pro wrestling. <laughs> and I was like, these two, I think, are just going to be such generational stars. I think Starlight Kid's going to end up being one of the biggest stars in Joshi in the last, like, decade. I just I just have such, like, I was watching this and I was like, these are two can't miss, can't fuck up stars. And I would be, I would be very surprised and very disappointed if they got fucked up in some way. Um, my match of the year, uh, a lot of the same reasons that of Tanahashi and Ishii, was Shingo Takagi versus Kazuchika Okada from uh, January 4th. Very fitting. Uh, this started, This kicked off the, the 50th anniversary year. It felt like uh, this was this was Okada's time to like really go on another giant run. Uh, again, just had kind of that old school feel to me. I love Shingo. He's one of the best wrestlers ever. Okada is one of the five wrestlers I consider to be the greatest wrestlers of all time. Uh, so... Just that was a match made for me, made in heaven. Uh, and it was one of those matches that... And I think the Dome, the, the, the Dome has this advantage where it can make you forget about the COVID crowds just because of how expansive it is and the clapping kind of reverberating through. It just makes me forget. And this was one of those matches that made me forget about the crowd. And that's the highest, uh, the highest thing I can say about it. It's like, if you can make me forget that people can't hoot and holler, you've, you've really cracked through. Okay, great. And so we move on to promotion of the year, which is another uh, three choices. And so Liam, what have you got? So for my three promotions of the year, my number three, uh, you're going to be very surprised to hear this, but it was Gleet. Yeah, it's this little known company. <laughs> that, uh, no, Gleet, uh, it's been really fun this year. Uh, you've had El Linderman on top as G-Rex champion. He's having all these banger matches with Tamora, with uh, T-Hawk, with Ito. It's been a lot of fun watching this stuff um, unfold. We've had a lot of um, expansion out into other companies throughout this year. Started off with Old Japan, then went with New Japan. And of course, we're all wrapped up with Glee version 3, which just happened like two days ago, which did over a thousand paid allegedly and um so yeah just all around i really enjoyed glee this year i think it's been a lot of fun um my number surprised two was you had it this low. Hmm? i'm surprised you had it this low um the reason i had it this low was because i just feel like it didn't break through into having any match i would consider match of the year level like a lot of really fun four and four and one quarter stuff N uh, especially, I think last year they they delivered a lot more in that four point five range, which you saw more with like Illindemans versus Tamora at Gleet version one, and then the the big Strong Hearts versus Bulk Orchestra tag, which were like legitimate match of the year candidates. I didn't have the Eerie match as um high as other people, so that's why it uh, kind of stopped from going a little bit higher. Because um my second uh, option was New Japan. And New Japan just did deliver on those high-end matches where Glee didn't. And um, yeah, New Japan feels like it's primed to break out like it did again in the early 2010s. It feels like we're about to approach that second golden era. It's just we're waiting for everything to come back to normality and then everything's going to blow up again. I don't know, Suit, you probably felt the same way having watched it a lot this year. It really feels like New Japan's primed to blow up again. And... Um, as we get uh, to my number one, number one's going to be interesting because it's someone, it's something that I haven't given any awards to yet, but I think it's the most consistent promotion in the world. Uh, Storytelling wise, it's one of the most interesting uh, promotions in the world. I have to, because I assume it's going to be in his top three, but yeah, I really loved, um, really, really, really loved Dragon Gate this year. And uh, I'll close it with the quote, why be the number two when you can be the only one? Okay, great. Thanks, uh, Liam, and now suit. Okay, um, copy and paste Liam. Number three, Glate. Number two, New Japan. Number one, Dragon Gate, for pretty much the same reasons. Let's um, go. <laughs> I, I picked Glate for number three because I liked the um, the Lindemann Irie match, 
and I couldn't think of another uh, another place to put number three. Uh, number two, New Japan. Um, like Liam said, they do feel poised for a resurgence. Um, their U.S. Uh, group that they've got, uh, the guys from AEW who want to go over there, the guys that they already have, it does feel like once that integration can fully happen, that New Japan's going to uh, return to the uh, quality level that a lot of people uh, remember it having uh, pre-COVID. And then number one, Dragon Gate, just making new stars, building for the future, and just consistently, just consistently having really good matches uh, on up and down their shows. So, uh, yeah, Dragon Gate is very much poised to. I feel like they're poised to break out like New Japan did uh, back in 2013. Like they are really set up to have a big, a big 2020 decade. So, yeah, number one, Dragon Gate. All right, and Paul. Okay, so for my number three, I was like struggling actually quite a bit with this. And the promotion that actually ended up on this was probably the biggest surprise to me. Um, I fought for a while, maybe about putting Noah there, but then there was just too much at the top of the card that was bothering me. So I couldn't pull the trigger on that. Didn't really consider New Japan because after Wrestle Kingdom, I really only watched like Okada matches and Best of Super Juniors. So I thought about like, what is like a promotion that like, to me has just been like really good, really solid throughout the year. Didn't really do anything to like piss me off. So and it was really, at the end of the day, I was like, I thought about it and I settled on Glead. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, there wasn't really anything like super great where I'm like, oh, this is amazing. But like, they've been booking their shows well. I like the G-Rex tournament. Like whenever I tune into the shows, I'm like, yeah, these are like good shows. They're very enjoyable. So. Yeah, I went with Glee as my number three. I went with Dragon Gate as my number two. Um, much has been already been talked about, like them developing new talent and like that the booking is always like incredibly solid. Uh, couldn't put them number one though, because I just thought there wasn't really that. And like all memes aside, there is just a certain limit on what you can get out of Kai in a Dreamgate match. So I think that to me was like holding the promotion back a little bit. So my promotion of the of the year ended up being so far ended up being all Japan. Uh, I thought all the stuff at the top of the card has been really really good uh, since Kento took back the title. Uh, I thought the championship carnival was booked really really well. I think they're finally starting to develop a good undercard because I think for a long time now this has been one of the big criticisms of all Japan that they have a bad undercard, but I think that's starting to change now. They've been taking some curious booking decisions as well, or they've taken some risks in the booking. And if those don't pay off, I, they might tumble out of the spot uh, in the second half of the year. But if they actually do pull them off, then I think the promotion is going to be in a really great spot. And they've been really good in the first half of so far. Oh, how dare you besmirch a good name of Kai? Look, I, lo- I love Kai, but again, like, don't let your memes be dreams, but also don't let memes cloud your perception of what is actually happening i don't know man these dreamgate title matches i thought have actually been very good this year i mean i'm not saying they're bad but it's also not like what i would maybe normally expect like so yeah i Just also like, think historically now kai gets a bad rap absolutely like oh yeah I've absolutely been... that's not what i'm saying at all with this but it's like oh no i, I wasn't like putting him and i look at like just... kento matches and i'm like no like you have yeah. to pick the kento matches here yeah, that's fair enough. I remember I started watching some very early Wrestle One uh, stuff, as I am one to do, and um, I was watching these Kai matches, and I'm like, I understand. Like people often scoff at the decision to send Sonata on excursion and build the company around Kai early on in Wrestle One, but I get it because you watch him there, and you're like, yeah, he is kind of more developed at this point, and then all the way through until we get like the. Dean Ambrose cosplay Kai era. I think he's really solid in that spot. He goes to the old Japan and does the Kendo uh, Mashimo tag team. And I'm like, oh, I really like that as well too. And then he goes to Dragon Gate and then he kind of starts off as the baby face and it's kind of weird. But by the time he becomes Dream Gate champion, I'm like, yeah, fuck yeah, Kai. I mean, I will say, I think in really just kind of any era, 
it is smarter to build your promotion around Kai than it is to build your promotion around Sonata. Because one has charisma and the other one doesn't. Yeah, but re- did you remember the hair and the gear? <laughs> what, from Kai or from Sonata? From Sonata. He, he had the full... Oh, like, Seiya Sonata. Um, build yeah, an yeah. ace cosplay. <laughs> yeah. And he just... Like, when everyone else in Japan is doing the Fairy Young Boy stuff, he just calmly walks to the ring and has boring matches like he still does now. All right. Well, anyway, I think Kai's rep is going to improve from this Dreamgate run, and people will give him a more fair shake looking at his career, I think. And so up next, Taylor. Uh, My number three promotion of the year was Tokyo Joshi. I talked about I have some issues with their booking, but the in-ring stuff has been really good. They got a lot of uh, really talented workers on their roster. They have a really strong class of rookies or near rookies that have really built up their undercard and midcard that really make getting through full shows really easy. The shows always fly by for me. I'm really looking forward to their Summer Sun Princess show in a week. Uh, My number two promotion of the year is Stardom. I think this is since the acquisition by Bushi Road a few years ago, this has been the best year Stardom has had. I thought they had a fairly bad 2020, even though they got some hype for some matches uh, between COVID and the loss of Hanakamura, to me, it was just sort of a bad year, partially out of their control. I thought last year they still had some hiccups, but this year they've sort of ironed a lot of their issues out and gotten a lot better. Uh, but like Liam, a promotion I have not talked about much or at all is my number one, and that is Dragon Gate. Dragon Gate is really my ideal promotion in terms of merging. Uh, Great wrestling with really interesting, well-thought-out storylines. I think it's so fascinating to me that the wrestlers that I really connected with when I got into Dragon Gate a number of years ago, you know, talking about Tozawa and Shingo and Shima and people like that, Yoshino, those people are either gone or a lot of them have been cycled down the card in some way, shape, or form, and yet you have this almost entirely new crop of people. And I don't ever watch the shows thinking, you know, watching a Dragon Dia match or something and thinking, oh, I wish this was Tozawa instead. They've done such a good job of keeping the promotion fresh. It isn't the same people on top. It isn't the same people just doing the same things over and over again. And I think that that's really an underrated skill that they have that really almost no other promotion in the world has shown their level of capability to do that sort of thing especially in covid times as well to still be able to shuffle things around and do interesting things while under these restrictions is very impressive but uh up next on the uh, open the voice gate awards (laughs) all right and next up chris um my number three pick is Glit. Um, I like many of their decisions, like pulling the trigger on Elinaman as the first champion. I like their roster with strong hearts, their faction, 60 seconds and stuff. Their whole product with shoot style versus and or pro wrestling. Um, so Glit is my number three here. Number two is Freedoms. Um, I think they had a good first six months here with, um, for example, repackaging Kenji Fukimoto um, under this ridiculous-looking mask um, and make him the brown-red Fuki and put him to uh, ERE. And bringing in Drew Parker, of course, uh, Takeda came back as a, like I said, tweener-ish guy. Um, So I've picked Freedoms as my number two. And number one is New Japan. Um, like Liam said before, they were re- really good with the important matches and um, it felt like they are going into another great period of time. And so New Japan got a lot of heat the last years, but I think they did very, very good the first six months. So I've put New Japan above the others. Okay, great. Thanks. And uh, for my promotions of this half year, uh, number three, going with great slash gleet. 
Uh, again, like I think most people have mentioned it, like a lot of fun, a really fun roster, maybe not necessarily the most high-end stuff, but fun to watch. They sort of, they just passed their sort of first year anniversary of the first major show. So they proved the haters and doubters wrong uh, to survive this year. And, uh, but my biggest issue with the company is I would say, uh, stop dropping out all your young guys to outsiders so much. Uh, number two, uh, All Japan, uh, just a really strong return uh, this first half year from the doldrums of 2020 and 2021. They're elevating young talent. Uh, one of the really issues that they had in like 2020 and 2021 was that they were clearly booking in a holding pattern, waiting to see like how much longer this pandemic was going to go on for. But once they decided to go back to Kento Miyahara as a Triple Crown champion because of Jake Lee's injury, that uh, really helped things. And they have seen a business spike. Uh, Mike Spears sort of crunched the numbers and they have the second highest average attendance in uh, Cork and Hall for the first six months of the year, uh, second only to Dragon Gate, uh, which I think is actually quite impressive to where they were uh, a year ago. And just, yeah, I mean, I'm just really excited to watch them again. Uh, but they have a few questionable sort of things set up that hopefully could really tank things. So hopefully they don't do anything stupid because they also have a Budokan show that they're going to be doing in September for their 50th anniversary. So hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, they continue their uh, performance, but uh, they could drop out of the top three, depending on the second half, how their second half of the year goes. And number one, another promotion I haven't talked really too much about, but I just simply can't like deny what they've been doing. I'm going with Stardom as uh, my promotion of the, the first half year. I've watched most of their big shows. I don't really watch their, um, their smaller ones, but like the things like the double header that they had at like Sumo Hall with those two World of Stardom matches with Shuri um, versus Mayu and Julia, like incredible stuff. And they just feel like they are on a promotion that's on the rise. I think, you know, the criticisms that people have talked about them are valid. And so, but they've just put together a strong thing. So I think we'll see, but it just feels to me that they are like the best company in Japan right now. And so from there, uh, we go into our guest category S award, which gets five votes um, for wrestler of the year. So I'll start with my five wrestlers of the year, sort of a bit of a mix of both pure in ring and, and, and a bit of like business as well. I think we sort of decided to go with the five because whenever you say wrestler of the year and slash most outstanding, however you want to divide it up, people sort of, they bleed into each other anyway. So we just decided we just mash it all together and give people five votes. So number five, I'm going with Yuma Aoyagi. I mean, I've been thinking he's been on the ascent for over a year now, but this year with winning the champion carnival, he real he really sealed it. He's been involved in some great tag matches as well and, and a couple of incredible singles matches. And I think he's one of the 25 best wrestlers of, in the world, although I don't think he really gets that sort of recognition. Uh, number four, I'm going with Azumi. Uh, she's, like I said, she's broken through. Her high speed sort of style is turning a lot of heads and is just so much fun to watch. And so I think that she's really deserving to be in the discussion of being one of the top wrestlers. Number three, uh, Kaito Kiyomiya. Uh, in some ways, he hasn't had a great year from like a kayfabe perspective. He's he's lost a decent amount, and he might be losing to Muto again in a, in a couple of weeks. Actually, I think two weeks from today. Uh, but like for me, the reason why I, I put Kiyomiya at number three is like I think he's just purely one of the best in ring wrestlers in the world right now. Like he's at that phase. Like people talked about Okada um, several years ago, although he's slowed it down. But like in like the six man tags on spot shows, like he's working his ass off. He's going out and doing like 45 minute matches against Yoshinari Ogawa at like small shows in front of 200 people. That was also an incredible match. So he's just like purely, he gets it because it's just how damn good he is in the ring. Uh, number two, uh, Kento Miyahara this year has been a return to form both because he's been out of the triple crown scene since March of 2020 was the last time he held it. He came back. He's popped business and has had some great match of the year level quality matches. And I think he's sort of, you know, back on people's radar as one of the best wrestlers in the world. Number one, I'm going to go with uh, Shuri. Um, I mean, she's been having incredible title matches this year. She just feels like an epic wrestler that is at the top. I mean, just incredible. Those, like I said, the incredible back-to-back -back performances against Julia and Mayu Iwatani just sort of like sealed that as like just 
like everything you want out of a pro wrestler, just in terms of like in-ring work and just sort of the aura she gives off. And so Chris, who do you have? My number five pick is Al Linderman as the forefront of Gleed, as the first champion. I liked most of his matches at Gleed, so I've picked in at number five. Number four is Daisuke Masaoka, the resurrection of Daisuke Masaoka from being a jobber in the bigger multi-man matches at Freedoms to being a champion again and headlining the biggest show in promotion history. Number three is Sex Saber Jr. I absolutely loved his New Japan Cup run, so I put him above the other two. Um, my number two pick is Kazuchika Okada. And it's like the same with my number one pick, uh, Will Osprey. Uh, despite picking not one of their matches as my uh, top three, they had the highest amount of great matches overall for me, not only in Japan and Osprey's case. So I've put them at number uh, two and one. And yeah, like I said, Osprey winning here for me this year, he was absolutely insane, not only in Japan, like I said, but out, outside as well. Yep, definitely. I think a lot of Osprey's uh, resume this year comes from like match like his against Michael Oku and um, uh, Nick Wayne overseas for sure. And so next up is Taylor. My number five pick was Mizuki from Tokyo Joshi. I think that she had that great match on the January 4th show with Mi Yamashita and then has held down the tag division as part of the Magical Sugar Rabbits with Yuka Sakazaki. Uh, I think she's super talented. I think really, in my opinion, outside of Mi Yamashita, if I had to pick someone to guarantee a good match of the rest of the Tokyo Joshi roster, it would by far be Mizuki. I think she's super talented. I hope that she gets the shot at the top of the company because I think the crowd is behind her and I think she's super talented. My number four is Shiri. Uh, I agree that she's had a great run as champion, had a number of really great matches. So I had to get her in the top five. My number three, a little bit, of an out of the box pick. I picked Suzu Suzuki. She hasn't had a really top end year in terms of match quality. She's had a number of good matches, but no really blow away matches. But I just think that her, uh, her and prominence, you know, showing up in stardom, having the feud there, Suzu is in the catch the wave tournament. She will be in the stardom uh, five-star grand prix coming up. She just feels like a hot commodity uh, with prominence, even though the prominence shows themselves don't feel all that hot, they as a group sort of traveling around to these different promotions feels really cool. And Suzu sort of is the front of that group as the young uh, up and coming superstar, if they can get it right. So had to put her in there. My number two is Azumi. I think she's had a number of really, really great matches this year. I think for a number of years, She's been maybe one of the most underrated wrestlers in the world, even though she's still very young. And finally getting a chance to prove it in some big time matches. And my number one wrestler of the year is Starlight Kid. Uh, she sort of goes hand in hand with Azumi, as I talked about in their match that they had together. Uh, but Starlight Kid, super talented, has sort of the wind in her sails now with a big push in stardom. And she just feels like someone who is having great matches and is also treated like a humongous deal. You know, she's not at the top of the company fighting for, you know, fighting Shuri for the title, but it still feels like she is almost one of the biggest focal points in that company, as well as in all of Joshi. So she was my easy number one pick for wrestler of the year. Okay, great. And now Paul. Okay, so my number five pick is Shun Skywalker. No, he hasn't really had any kind of match of the year contender so far this year. But the reason I actually put him in this slot um, is to kind of like borrow a, borrow a uh, baseball term is to me, he's like a five tool wrestler at the moment. Like he just has like pretty much everything. Like he has the in ring ability, he has the character work, he's just the most complete wrestler, really. So, really, the only thing that has been holding him back to me is, or for me to put him even higher, is the fact that he just hasn't really been put in a position to just have great matches. But I think once Dragon Great starts pushing him stronger in like a singles role, like he's just going to shoot up like these rankings. 
my number four pick is Yuma Aoyagi. Uh, I think he just has had a tremendous year so far, and he's actually someone that I have kind of like slotted in where I, I might actually expect him to rise even higher, depending on how the second half of the year goes. Just him finally breaking through in a championship carnival final. Like that was just really important for him. And it just really, it also feels like the promotion is behind him uh, and that he is very likely going to be a triple crown champion very, very soon. And then depending on how that goes, that will determine his final ranking at the end of the year. But for now, he's number four. So the top three for me were actually incredibly close. It actually came down to like the most recent kind of big singles performances, basically, to determine the final ranking. So at number three, I have Go Shiyazaki. Uh, he just had just an insane array of matches. That challenge series that he did in Kirken Hall, like, all ma all matches there were just amazing, despite the fact that he lost all of them. He had a like I already talked about the great title match he had with Nakajima at the beginning of the year, uh, and then just really strong stuff just throughout the entire time uh, throughout the entire time of the year. We'll have to say what why he then slotted in at number three was because of his match with uh, uh, where he lost the title to Kojima at the Cyber Fight Festival. Uh, that match just like it was really, really good, but it was not great. So that slotted him at, in at number three. Then my number two is Kento Miyahara. I've already gushed about how much that really improved everything at the top of the card in all Japan and really like elevated the entire promotion to me. Uh, just really, really good matches like throughout the championship carnival, like every one of his title matches was amazing. And yeah, it just really showed why he is the ace of the promotion. And then at number one, I have the greatest wrestler of all time, Kazuchika Okada. Uh, just adding yet another tremendous title reign to his already really stacked lineup. Uh, it's, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, really, the thing I watched the most from New Japan this year was Okada title matches, and all of them were worth it. He just like he just didn't miss at all a single time uh, when he defended that title, and he is like his match with Jay White, like I talked about that already, and also like the match at Forbidden Door as well, the four way, like which is really not a format that he is used to. Like he did amazingly in that as well, and he still has the G one coming up this year as well, so it's going to take a lot to like lo like dislodge him from the top spot uh, going forward. Okay, and now suit. All right, so for number five, for Wrestler of the Year, I have Shun Skywalker. Uh, his character work has been fantastic in Dragon Gate, and he's doing some really good tag work with Diamante at the moment as uh, Twin Gate champs. If he had a more high-profile singles match, I would have him higher up the list but he doesn't have it right now, but I still fit him in at number five. He's been doing very good work in Dragon Gate. Number four, I have Will Ospreay. I had to put him on my list because he was in my match of the year for Puro, but he hasn't been at that high level in New Japan, you know, at the start of the year. Uh, he did the New Japan Cup match with Zach, which was very good, but he's also been kind of just anchored with... Um, Sonata lately in Japan so again he's my overall wrestler of the year but a lot of that comes you know in England or in the U.S. so uh, Osprey at number four here number three and this is fully off the strength of his New Japan Cup run is Zack Sabre Jr. Uh, he reminded everybody who he was uh, he had the uh, I ran it down earlier but the match with Okan the match with Osprey the final with uh, yeah, Naito was in the final. And then the title match with Okada was very good as well. And then since we're counting Forbidden Door, the match with Claudio was very fun uh, in that spot as well. So Zach at number three. Number two, Shingo Takagi. Uh, again, he's got the Sabre match from the New Japan Cup. He had the Wrestle Kingdom match. Uh, he's uh, been doing this very fun stuff with Tai Chi with the KOPW uh, title as well. It's been the best use of that uh, of that uh, title, if you want to call it that, since uh, 
since its inception. Although, you know, Shingo Takagi is a very high upgrade over Toriyano. Uh, so yeah, Shingo Takagi, number two. And then number one, uh, Okada. Again, match of the year at Wrestle Kingdom. Just a great title reign. The Naito series was very good. The Zack match was great. The Jay White match was great. And yeah, he's got a G1. Although I do think Osprey is in the better block for good matches. I think that C block is a killer. A block is less so, but you know, it's still Okada. So yeah, for my wrestler of the half year so far, number one, Kazuchika Okada. All right. And uh, Liam, did you fix your mic? Uh, no, is the answer. Uh, my mic died midway, so I had to call in with my phone now. Uh, because otherwise, whenever I tried to talk, you would hear a sharp screaming, like white noise. <laughs> uh, so I apologize for the, the quality drop immediately. But um, so my top five, I think most everyone was talked about, but uh, I will try and add a little something to it. Uh, number five is Shun Skywalker. Uh, the dude has just been just what a character. One of the most compelling and interesting characters in pro wrestling this year. Uh, Gatekeep, <laughs> Gaslight, Girl Boss, Shin Skywalker's ethos, uh, oh, a tremendous shit poster. It's if um just 2022 troll became a pro wrestler and became really oddly compelling and deep and nuanced to it too. Just a really good, just a guy that I get excited to see every time. He's done the stuff um in Dragon Gate. Obviously, he's jumped over and done some stuff with uh, Noah. Just uh, a really fun wrestler this year. My number four is um. <clears throat> Zack Sabre Jr. Guy has been crazy. Uh, the Osprey match is one of my favorite matches of the year. The Shingo match is one of my favorite matches of the year. Uh, I really thought he might win the title against the Carter. Yeah, the Naito match which was great. And of course, the Claudio match is going to be the thing that comes out recently. But even he's had a lot of fun lower mid card stuff too. He had the match with Doki yeah, um, at the Wrestle Kingdom Night 3. He had the match with Marafuji and Ogawa in Just Tap Out. He had the match with Kanan and Rene Abi. And all of these matches are just really, really fun. So he's kind of um, done the whole gauntlet. And the reason I kind of had Will in this spot before, but Zach's just delivered to a higher level in Japan. So that's why I gave him the one. Number three, I had to give it to the ace of the company, L. Linderman. Uh, dude, in 2021, I voted him as my most underrated. And in 2022, I, I want to give him some like credit for carrying this company. Um, all of Gleet's first year was basically built around Linderman. He, um, he was the voice and the heart of the company. He would close all the shows. He would have all the big matches. And now um, it feels like we're finally getting to see him. Uh, flourish obviously he uh he's been around he did the old japan stuff at the start of the year went into the best of the super juniors had quite the run there had the match with el desperado of course we had the t-hawk match dropped and the, um, the eria match which i think is the, the most well-known match of the year just a really solid as hell year and he's um being the face of this company that i love and uh, the company that he's helping build to um, even the uh, takanori ito at the end of bleed version three uh, made note that it's like you weren't the main event, but you should be the one closing the show, which kind of sums up uh, El Linderman at the moment. Uh, number two, for number two and number one, uh, two of the wrestlers I consider to be the best wrestlers ever. So number two, the other ace, Hiroshi Tanahashi, kind of a sleeper pick, I feel, this year. But if you go back and look at all the matches he's had, this dude has been rocking all year. The Ishii match, obviously, the really big highlight. But the Moxley match at um, the Vendor was one of my favorite matches of the year. Had the four-way in America, which was awesome. He had the tag with Okada against Kaito and Keiji Muto, which was really fun. The Sonata match, which was really fun. He did the, the teaming up with the New Japan Legends versus Stronghorts and Tatsumi Fujinami, which was awesome. He had the tag match with Kenta Miyahara against Shake Lee and Taichi. Had the Naito match. He had the really fun Yo match. Goto at um, Dominion came to AEW. Obviously, this one doesn't count as much, but it just kind of adds a, uh, some context to it. All had the match on AEW main event TV, which he looked great in. I've just been, been a real big fan of Tanahashi this year. I think the dude has rocked and um, deserves a lot of credit. And I like the Kenta match at Wrestle Kingdom, even though Paul despised it. Um, and then, you know, number one is the same number one. <laughs> it's Kazushiko Okada. Um, 
my biggest hope of the 50th anniversary year was that we were going to get Okada taking the reins of the company again, and that delivered. And my man got the uh, Anoki robe on, and he was like, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rep this company in the same way now," and he's just killing it. Um, every match is every like major match has been a banger. He had the Osprey match, the Naito match, the Shingo match, the Saber match, the Desperado match, the Jay White match. Obviously, it was great. Again, he was in the tag with Kaito Kimura and Keiji Muto. Then he goes to the US, and he, he also has the SEMA match. Okada is really having a hell of a year. I really look forward to seeing how the rest of it plays out. I hope by the end of the year he's champion again, and I hope uh, he will make it rain and bring back the hooting and the hollering to New Japan Pro Wrestling. All right. So, uh, yeah, I think we got a good mix of perspectives and uh, some variety in the choices. Uh, maybe I was a little, su- I expected Dragon Gate to do well, but maybe I was a little surprised at just how well New Japan did. So we'll have to see if some of these companies and some of these wrestlers can keep up uh, momentum for the rest of the year. So now we'll close out with some plugs. Liam. Mm. So, yes, uh, you can listen to You've Got to Be Kidding Me. I can't give you a day because we're very all over the place when it comes to the days we record, uh, but we're covering every single month in TNA history and all that that encompasses, the good, the bad, the Russo, uh, everything else in that uh, ethos, um, tnachad.com for the Patreon, where we have reviewed every episode of Rinka King. We have reviewed the Monday Night Wars, we're about to finish, uh, we're about to review <laughs> Global Force Wrestling. I'm getting, like, you guys get to talk about really cool Japanese wrestling. This is what I, I have to talk about. Uh, what else are we doing? We have, um, once we refer- <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna, we're going to review, review All Wheels Wrestling at one point. Uh, and coming up soon, we're gonna start Gleet and Wrestle One stuff. So there's gonna be a lot of fun Puro stuff coming. Oh, of course. My, the, my baby rain takers where we were going through every uh big new japan show on the 10-year anniversary so there's a lot of good stuff over there as well follow me at the gleet muda you can follow the podcast account at tna history pod uh jump into the discord uh the voice of wrestling discord and talk to us there have fun thank you for having me on and thank you for letting me talk about puro all right. Hopefully your mic works uh, soon. All right, Suit. All right. You can follow me on Twitter at Suit Williams, where I recently described Brody King as a coloring book for troubled children. Uh, you can also uh, hear me on my podcast, Smart Sports, where we talk sports and pro wrestling, although the sports tends to just be American football. So don't get your hopes up for any like Premier League talk or anything. Uh, I think we talked about the um, Stanley Cup finals on the last episode. Yeah, I think so. Uh, and yeah, voicesofwrestling.com. Uh, I do a lot of my writing there. You can check out my uh, Brock Lesnar retrospective series, The Brockumentary, Chapter 11, covering the uh, Iron Man match with Kurt Angle on SmackDown, is coming soon. Uh, and at some point, I will talk about Brock's New Japan stuff as well. But uh, that is a, a time away. But I just needed to connect that to Puro. So, yeah, that is all my stuff. Okay, and Taylor. I am the co-host of Jumping Bomb Audio, a podcast all about the world of Joshi Wrestling. We release episodes every other Monday. We have an episode coming up this week that we will be covering the Tokyo Joshi summer sun princess show the stardom new blood show and a number of other things you can follow us on twitter at j bomb audio so check that out and chris um you can follow me on twitter at show fn hole and that's it <laughs> yeah and you write for voices of wrestling right too yeah i do i do yeah okay perfect all right so i want to thank everyone uh, for their participation and Paul and I will be back sometime next week covering the latest developments in all Japan and Noah but then also the semis and the finals of the King of DDT tournament so we'll see you very soon <laughs>